I'm Melissa Schwartz, is our um, Hi, folks. campaign liaison yes. for, through, uh, through the UPS. She and I collaborate and try to find interesting and informal, <coughs> informative topics for, for our campaigns to address. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we appreciate that help collaboration. And she'll be um, afterwards about well, a couple of different things that she uh, of interest to uh, the UPS. Um, but so we are.
sorry. Anxiety, right? Well, speaking in front of the group. Um, I'm really glad to be here, and I'm really glad to be talking about this particular topic, because I think uh, it's really important that we spend some time thinking about well-being. And what does it take for our kids to establish well-being, right? Not just what's wrong, but what's right. Um, as Dr. Lillian said, um, I have a practice in Old Town, Scottsdale area called Center of Psychology and Psychology. You can find more information on our practice uh, at that website or on Facebook page. We post a lot of articles there as well. But just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I've been in practice for about 20 years now. I uh, work as a school psychologist. I work in hospitals. I work in private practice settings. And I've worked with kids through preschool through um, adulthood. Uh, but really, my focus at this point in my career is really in early childhood. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Talk about it. It's it's sort of exciting. <laughs> What's going to happen next? Um, is this okay? I don't want to. Thank open you. Yeah. Okay. Fabulous. Uh, so as I was saying, I've worked in uh, schools, hospitals, <coughs> and private practice settings for over 20 years, and um, I just really love kids, and I really love working with kids and families. It's really my life's passion, and I'm really grateful to be able to do that work. I wanted to talk with you a little bit um, and, and give you an overview of what we're going to discuss this evening. Um, my goal is to buzz through a lot of information in a short period of time, so I would ask that you hold your questions until the end. We'll try to wrap up by around 7 o'clock, so we have some time for a question and answer. But just as a reminder, we are uh, doing that Facebook Live stream, so let's hold those questions until the end when it comes time for Q&A. We'll, we'll shut that down. We'll have a, a chance to ask some general, non-specific questions. And if you do have questions specific to your child or your situation, um, you can find my information at in, in the back there and, and, um, as well as up here, okay? we would be happy to talk with you. Great? Fabulous. So, when parents come to see me, I can boil it down to usually one of these three questions that are at the heart of the matter. People are asking, what's the right educational fit for my child with whatever might be going on with them? What is the deal with these social, emotional, or behavioral issues? That's a big question. Uh, and finally, what can I do to help my child grow, to help my child flourish, right? So what I'm hoping to talk about today is these three questions, these five questions, five fundamentals. Why early identification matters, and boy, folks, it does matter. I've seen that, and I can tell you a little bit about that in my years of work. What are some expected behaviors that we might typically see with gifted children versus what we call red flag behaviors, things that, hmm, this is a little concerning. Maybe we should do something more uh, to investigate this. We'll touch on some perhaps new approaches to managing anxious, defiant, or avoidant behavior. I'm sure none of you have kids from that <laughs> kind of going on. Um, and then really get to some essential skills that we can practice with our kids, practice and teach intentionally to improve uh, mental health and well-being. With the final reminder that there's lots of pathways for your child and lots of supports. So, I'm speaking to an audience of gifted uh, parents, and I want to remind you that gifted children are in many ways outliers, right? Even within that gifted community, we have outliers. So there are those children who are identified as gifted, perhaps in one area. There are children who are identified as gifted in multiple areas. There are children who need enrichment, and there are children who need acceleration. There are children who need radical acceleration. Right? When you see one gifted child, you see one gifted child. So you really need to dial in a little bit to what's going on with your particular child and recognize that, well, we sometimes try to speak in generalities. It really varies. And so it's important to kind of recognize this, this asynchrony that often goes along with gifted uh, intellect, in, especially in early childhood. We know that the implications of gifted learners in early childhood are that their optimal development requires, really requires, differentiated educational experiences, um, particularly over time, that become increasingly targeting those same domains where they um, display greatest ability. And that's from the National Association of Gift Gifted Children. For those of you who are unfamiliar with that organization, the NAGC 
website is a great source for information. So I want to talk about early identification of your three children, early identification. I think one of the common myths or assumptions that I see um, with identifying children early is that every child is gifted. Every child has gifts. Well, right? Yes. However, what does your child need to best flourish educationally? What do they need to best flourish in social and emotionally? So I hear a lot of times, ah, it's not really possible to identify that, or that's going to be so changeable, or you can't really um, get an accurate identification of kids at a young age. And um, I, too, want to stop and say that I can recognize and see that actually we can get a lot of really great information that helps guide your child's educational placement and decision making. Part of the reason I know this is that I did some research during the course of my clinical training. I got really interested in why were people seeking uh, identification of their child as gifted? What was, what was the purpose? And what was the time frame? I got really disturbed by this statistic. Most parents, I surveyed mm, over 400 parents in the state of Arizona. And of those 400 parents in the state of Arizona, the vast majority said, oh yeah, we had indications of giftedness as early as three. It was pretty evident, pretty clear. However, a lot of those children didn't get identified until the age of eight, right? So I got real interested in what's happening in those intervening years between three and eight. And I found a lot of um, kind of dismaying statistics. I found kids who started school eager to learn and then no longer liking school, no longer wanting to go to school. Um, kids whose abundant energy, shall we, shall we say, uh, was sometimes mythologized or wasn't put in the right or the proper con context, right? So in that decision to seek private evaluation and identification of gifted services, in my survey, I found that 86% said, well, academic issues were important. Makes sense. But fully 66%, more than half, said social, emotional, or behavioral issues were also really important to them. I think it's important to identify this and think about this because we know that uneven development is actually quite normal for gifted children, right? Um, you've got a child who's emotionally intense, a child who perhaps has some behavioral outbursts. In and of itself, that's not atypical for a gifted child. You might have the child who's perfectionistic. You might have the child who can be somewhat rigid and flexible in their thinking. And I see some smiles and some nods. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I did some speaking earlier today. I was uh, had an opportunity to, to visit a number of classrooms in the district and to really talk with some of these kids. They're so wise. I, I really am excited to share with you some of what they said. Um, before I move on, actually, I wanted to that brings me to a question. Were any of you badgered into coming here tonight by yourselves? You? Yeah? No? Yeah? <laughs> Mom, dad, you have to go. Uh, because kids recognize that we need these skills too. The adults in their lives need these skills too. And if we help ourselves, we can help them. So we know that kids can be anxious. We know that kids have worries and fears. We know that for gifted children, some of them have these endless questions, endless negotiations. Oh my goodness, it's exhausting, right? Um, they can also wrestle with these really abstract concepts at times when they're really young, which is a wonderful and an awful thing because they have the intellectual ability to think about this, but they don't yet have the emotional maturity or the life experience to put it in the proper context. And I'm sure you can relate to, to some of the questions that you've had to encounter. It seems that it always happens at bedtime. Doesn't it always happen at bedtime? <laughs> I, just, I just go to bed. <laughs> right? But, uh, yeah, fabulous. You might have the child who is bossy, or as I prefer to reframe it, has leadership skills. Right? <laughs> leadership skills. Seemingly endless energy. Oh, my goodness. The constant need for movement, the constant energy questioning. Maybe they have that hyper focus. <coughs> Again, it can be wonderful. It can be really difficult to shift them <coughs> off of that hyper focus. Um, you might have the child who's quirky. Quirky is one of my favorite 
kind of people. Um, I think they're the most interesting people. Um, and, and the other thing that I see and, and that I, I think is bad to see is when you have a child who might be masking their abilities, right? Um, I bet some of you in this room had a child who pretended they didn't know how to read when they actually did when they were young. Um, and sometimes feeling a little different than their peers. Again, if they're not in a proper setting. So without the, the proper context for this, I think these behaviors can be misunderstood, they can be misdiagnosed, and sometimes mistreated, right? So do we have a, a, a true clinical diagnosis of a, a child with ADHD or ADD? Do we have an anxiety disorder? Do we have an autism spectrum disorder? Do we have a dyslexia or another learning difference that might be going on? Um, Depressive symptoms, sensory processing issues. Well, we might. We might have a child who's what we call twice exceptional, right? They're intellectually gifted, and they have this other way of being. It's important that we not forget one or the other of those, that we really treat the whole child. Or we might have a child who's just showing what we consider to be very typical, expected behaviors for a young child. Doesn't mean we do nothing about it. We always want to be proactive, but we don't have to over pathologize some of these behaviors. Um, I want to give you an example. Um, an example that this is kind of an amalgam. This is not one person, but kind of a, a series of, of um, experiences that I've had where um, I'll give you an example of a child that might have come into my office. Seven year old male, reported concerns with handwriting, <coughs> processing speed emotional and behavioral intensity, and some interesting social mannerisms. Parents state that the child has intense outbursts of frustration, displays an excessive reaction to noise, refuses to accept responsibility for his role in things. Teachers say the child performs well, well above grade level academically, but a lot of difficulty with inattention, distractibility, and distress with other children not following the rules. Okay, so what might be going on here, right? Um, what the hypothesis was, not mine, but others, the hypothesis was that this was a child who had a learning disability and had ADHD and uh, maybe was on the spectrum uh, because they had some of these kinds of things going on. A thorough evaluation, though, indicated that this was a kid who was highly gifted. Not just highly gifted, closely for that profound gifted brain. And yeah, you would expect some difficulties with handwriting because what this child wanted to get down on paper was a whole lot more than what his little seven-year-old body and, and brain were able to do, right? So there's a lot of frustration around handwriting. Same thing with processing speed. This child did not have a problem with processing speed. This child's mind worked a mile a minute. With certain kinds of tasks, he could do blazing fast. The problem was perfectionism. I want to do it right. I want to do it perfect. If it doesn't look perfect, I'm going to get frustrated. I'm going to get upset. Right? And I cut down. Um, emotional behavioral intensity. Yeah, this was a kid who had a lot of emotions kind of bubbling to the surface. Um, some social mannerisms. By social mannerisms, they meant this is the kid who's correcting all the other kids in class. <laughs> I hear some chuckles. Yeah, sure. Right? Because they weren't doing it right. They weren't following the rules. This child had a very clear idea of how things should go, how things should be, and was still in a stage of development where that's really actually pretty normal. It was heightened, though, because he was highly and profoundly gifted. So it was really intense and really pronounced. It wasn't an indication of an autism spectrum issue where the child didn't have social emotional reciprocity or had some social communication difficulties. It was really a matter of this child's pretty pronounced developmental asynchrony at this point in his development. Gifted child, some typical difficulties that you would expect for his age compared with his intellect, compounded by the fact that just Cognitively, he's at a stage of moral development where he's still in kind of some black and white thinking, right? Not every kid at seven has that shades of gray where they can see another person's perspective or they can take another, another view of things. That comes with time. That's really just development and developmentally normal, right? So um, this is an 
example of, you know, without proper context, this can be really misunderstood and go down the wrong path because there's unintended consequences for that, right? If that child hadn't been identified and, and kind of had the right pieces and parts put around them, it could be that they're going to struggle unnecessarily for a, a very long time. The negative aspects of their experience are kind of reinforced, right, and strengthened. We'll talk to you about what your kids said about this. Um, it leads to anxiety or perhaps learned helplessness. And of course, there's effects on motivation for learning as well. So the question I get asked, what should I be doing or not doing, right? Well, probably my first bit of advice is use common sense. Use common sense. Do what you think comes naturally. Be sure that you encourage all aspects of your child's identity, not just that gifted piece, right? I think sometimes we, we put a lot of emphasis on that, or others around us put a lot of emphasis on that. Um, one of the ways that we combat that is if you have a child who gets praised all the time by other people for how smart he or she is. Yeah, he's a good kid. Yeah, she works really hard. Yeah, I'm really proud of what a kind person she is, right? You can kind of deflect that praise and, and make sure that other aspects of that child's identity are rising to the surface as well. Follow their lead. Don't push. We know that even though they're capable of so much developmentally, they still need to be a child. They still need to slow down, right? So there's some hazards to forced early learning. And by forced, I don't mean that we're, you know, shoving it down their throats, but going too fast when they're not ready yet developmentally for that. I really think after 20 years of experience that one of the things I take away from my work with kids is they need your time, they need your attention. There's a lot that can be fixed, a lot that can be made better, and it's quality time, quality attention, and I'm sure you'd agree. Um, I'm going to buzz through this, but I, I do think it's important to recognize that there are different <coughs> pathways to assessment. In the, in the school district, of course, you're familiar with what that process can be. Um, some school districts offer individual IQ assessments. You can have just group administered assessments. Um, scores are sent home. Private testing is a different pathway, and for some folks, it yields more information or information that helps with other kinds of questions and concerns. So that's probably a little bit about that pathway as well. Okay. I say that assessment should inform decision making. I sometimes get the question of, well, should I test my child? If I should test my child, when should I test my child? And I say, test when you need the information. Test when you have a question that you haven't answered yet. Test when you need objective data to help you inform your decision making, right? Um, one of the tests that I use sometimes is the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children, the WISC-5. <coughs> and I, I like to think of the different domains that we assess um, as uh, related to these concepts. Not all the time, but again, in a general way, I see that the verbal comprehension index, not just verbal ability or vocabulary, but this is kind of the librarian, the store of knowledge, if you will. The visual spatial index, when I have a child who scores high there, I often say, oh, that's the kid with that architectural engineering mind, right? Fluid reasoning, the detective, the logical, analytical side of things. Working memory, oh my goodness, working memory so important, and it's a domain that we don't often tap unless we do this kind of assessment. Working memory is that general manager, the GM, that keeps everything going and organized and, and working together. Um, processing speed index, we often see that as uh, slowed down for a lot of kids who are gifted. It's the clerical worker, just like that little seven-year-old uh, example that we gave where um, speed, accuracy, precision, and all of these have implications, of course, for how your child's going to do in the classroom. And all of this has implications for some of the things that we're here to talk about tonight with regard to mental health and well-being. Making sure your child's in the right place to give you the right kind of support. So there's lots of different programs, and again, beyond the scope of our discussion this evening, but you're very lucky to be in a district that has such a comprehensive 
um, array of services at every level, from preschool through high school. It's a, it's a standard in the nation, folks. I work with families from all over the valley and in this region, and, and PD is a standard in the nation. And you're lucky to have the Peter Brillias. This is one of the most recent books that she's been the author of, The Teacher's Guide to Flexible Grouping and Collaborative Learning, which was the book of the year last year at the National Association of Teachers Children. So congrats to us, you know, for that. Um, other things to think about with that placement issue, um, does my child need acceleration? Is early admission or grade skip something that we need to consider? I think that in the case of PD, you're fortunate that you don't have to make those kinds of hard decisions because you have such a good range of services available to you. But these are other things that you should be thinking about for your, if your child what they need. One of the things that I want to highlight here, mentoring, oh my goodness. If your child has a passion, that's something they're really interested in, they really love, make sure they get mentoring in that. It can be you, it can be a coach, it can be a teacher, uh, it can be an after school program. Find somebody in the community. I saw a little guy who really loved dinosaurs. I mean, really loved dinosaurs. <laughs> really. <laughs> <laughs> he got involved with a bunch of paleontologists. So this little <laughs> elementary school kid was hanging out with all these adults at monthly meetings for the paleontology department or something, and had a blast. And they were so warm and welcoming and really encouraged his passion. How cool is that, right? Great. So it's important to find that goodness of fit academically, intellectually, and social emotionally. Um, and make sure that you recognize you all the supports and services that you have around you. It really does take a village, right? takes a community of people to, uh, to help your child grow and flourish. Remember, you're your child's first advocate. You're your child's best advocate. You know them better than anyone else. Make sure you know what's going on in their classroom. Make sure you know what's going on with them and advocate accordingly. But when people come to see me, this is one of the questions I get involved with too. What if it's not just uneven development? What if it's not just asynchrony? Well, we know that one in five children in the U.S. have learning or attention issues, and that's according to the National Council on Learning Disabilities, just a, um, a nationwide survey, survey just this last year. One in five, folks. One in five. So you know or love somebody with a learning or attention issue. I think it's important that we recognize that and treat that accordingly. We know that anxiety disorders are affecting as many as 30% of young people at some point before the age of 18. And this is from the 2018 Children's Mental Health Report. I wanted to mention that um, when I was speaking with kids in the classroom today, one of the things that I asked about was, what do we do when we worry too much? What do we do when we worry too much? Anybody come home and talk about that? Any kids? I hope they did. Some of them might have. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure what kind of a response I was going to get, to be honest. I wasn't sure how many kids felt like they worried too much. I was blown away by what kids <laughs> shared. I was blown away by the fact that all of them can relate to having worries. All of them can relate to having fears. And I want to make sure that we remember that's normal. Right? Every one of us has experienced worry. Worry is normal. We talk about the fact that a certain amount of worry is a good thing. Right? A certain amount of worry helps keep us motivated, helps keep us safe. And we had many radical examples of the things that might happen if <laughs> you were not being careful, being safe. Right? But, but I really was struck by but when I asked, what happens in your body? when we feel worried? What happens in your mind when we feel worried? They were so wise and they were so articulate about that. They talked about all the things we know about anxiety. Now, I'm not saying an anxiety disorder, but about what it feels like to be anxious. Headaches, stomach aches, heart beating fast, feeling hot, feeling cold, feeling sweaty, feeling jittery, feeling overwhelmed, feeling stressed. Um, 
one particularly poetic child said it's like being trapped in a cave, right? Um, lots of kids had some really good imagery around what that what that means for them. So if you think that your child's not worried, guess again. Probably every one of our kids has had that experience of worry. It's our job as parents to normalize that for them and to make sure that they have healthy coping skills to deal with that, right? We know that anxiety disorders, yeah, let, me, let me back up a minute and just say that with anxiety, we, when, when do we start talking about it as a, a real problem? It's a real problem when it's starting to get in the way, when it's really impacting your functioning, when it's preventing your child from doing things in their daily life, when it's causing a lot of stress or difficulty at home, right? So you might want to think a little bit about that and, and when that's interfering. But the, yes, it's one of the most common disorders that we see. It's also some of the easiest to treat, to effectively treat, right? Yet we often say anxiety is the invisible condition because symptoms are often ignored or it's all considered the great masquerader because the symptoms are misattributed to other issues. Some of the things kids said today about worry is that, well, sometimes when they're worried, they get angry or they act angry. That's one of those great masqueraders, right? And I said, guess what? That happens to parents too. <laughs> Have you ever had a mom or dad who got kind of mad at you about something and when you really think about it, they were mad because they were wor worried makes a big difference in how you respond, doesn't it? makes a big difference if you know that to be the case. So again, we talked about the fact that this is normal. And there's normal, healthy levels of worry and sadness. And there's things that happen when we're simply reacting normally, typically, to a situation that you should be worried about. We talk about really having difficulty when it becomes persistent and when it becomes severe, right? We know too that anxiety manifests in multiple ways. It manifests cognitively in the thoughts we have, what happens in our mind. It happens behaviorally, how children react, respond, and it, and it manifests physiologically in those stomach aches and headaches and sickness and whatever other kinds of uh, complaints that they physiologically, right? Children often react to intense feelings in this way. Maybe some adults do too. Uh, <laughs> acting out or tantrums. Arguing, negotiating, trying to manipulate. And I put that in air quotes because uh, I don't necessarily see it as an intentional manipulation. It's uh, I'm trying to figure things out trying to manage something that I don't have any control over. I'm trying to control the uncontrollable. They might avoid or withdraw, develop worries or fears, or display irritability or moodiness, sadness, often without intention or awareness. So we talk about it's time to take action if this gets in the way, if it significantly interferes with functioning, um, any time that these feelings are unwanted or out of Here's another example, and again, not one person, but kind of a combination of, uh, of things that I might see in my office. An 11-year-old female was reported shutting down behaviors, including tearfulness or a lack of response when they don't know the answer and is called upon in school. Um, maybe the child gives up easily, has what they call low frustration tolerance, is easily distracted, doesn't finish tasks they feel to be too difficult. Parents explain the child has what they see as excessive fear can be really overly negative in how they're self-evaluating and experiences some mood swings. <coughs> Teachers note that this child really shuts down around mathematics and that the associated shutting down behaviors when they're called upon or well, doesn't know an answer in class. Right? So thinking about this. <coughs> thinking about this. Uh, an evaluation tells us that there's not a, a, a learning difference here that's causing this 
<coughs> there isn't really another explanation that we can point to other than the fact that, yeah, there's some, some anxiety. And anxiety that has been there, low grade, for a while, but is becoming more interfering. A child with some unrealistic um, views of themselves, of how they should be, of how they should respond. And this is all self-driven, right? This doesn't necessarily come from a parent or from a teacher. Um, I talk about the fact that all of these kinds of symptoms and behaviors exist on a spectrum, right? We all have some degree of this. And some of us come more naturally wired for optimism or more naturally wired for pessimism than others. But regardless, we all have the ability to work at this, to improve this, to strengthen this over time. So this is a child who, again in our, our example that we would give here, would probably really benefit from a few things. The benefit from just looking at their sleep, their diet, their exercise, looking at the quality of their relationships and friendships would benefit from parents having the tools to kind of help talk this child through those experiences and would benefit from learning some of these skills through a type of uh, therapy we call cognitive behavioral therapy, which is aimed at thinking about how we think affects how we feel. This affects how we behave. And at, a, at this level, this is gifted kid with this perfectionist kid stuff, this is exactly the time to turn this around so it doesn't interfere more as they enter adolescence and beyond. Okay. Another example, again, um, kind of a combination of ideas from not just one person. A 12-year-old male with reported lack of motivation for work completion, difficulty regulating his emotions. Parents say the child procrastinates, has difficulty concentrating or sustaining attention, following directions, and listening to others. Parents say the child does not like being told what to do and doesn't really care about anybody else's agendas. Parents say the child has experienced so much frustration and distress over school assignments and homework that it ends up in tears. Teachers have a lot of concerns about this child's inattention, distractibility, organization, and work completion. So I think about that situation, right? Um, and again, not one real person, but if we were to say, okay, what's going on here? An evaluation might indicate that this is a child who actually has some legitimate learning issues, some dyslexia or dysgraphia or dyscalculia. 12 years old, probably what, seventh grade around that time? Why not, why wasn't this figured out sooner? Because he was a smart kid who worked hard, who was really conscientious, who tried their best, and was able to kind of surf their intellect for a long time. Get middle school, things get more complex. It got harder and harder to stay on top of that. He got to the tears. The other thing I want to point out about this example is a lot of this looks kind of disrespectful. Looks like a kid who's kind of angry, doesn't care about other people's agendas. That's one of the things that was said. This was a kid who was trying to control the uncontrollable. They were trying to show that they were in control, that they knew what was going on, when in fact they really felt completely the opposite. Same with the symptoms of inattention, the symptoms of distractibility, um, difficulty following directions. Some of that was related to the learning difference that this child had. Um, some of it was anxiety, which again is that great masquerader. One of the things I heard from lots of kids today when we talked about how it feels to be anxious, they said, I can't sit still. I can't stop fidgeting. Sometimes I don't look at people when they're talking to me because I'm, I'm really worried and anxious and they think I'm being disrespectful, but I really, I just can't look at them, right? So things are not always as they seem, I guess, is my point. Things are not always as they seem. It's really important to look at underlying issues that might be going on when you look at a child's behavior. When kids are anxious, they typically will express what we call poor self-regulation, right? These negative thinking cycles that 
they can't seem to stop inflexible thinking. They get stuck in this rigid impulsivity. They can often seem unempathetic. I hear that a lot. It just doesn't seem to care. It doesn't seem empathetic. And again, it's not that they truly lack empathy. It's that they're so stuck in this that they can't show that at the moment. When calm, they can express the skill. But when anxious, they can't. Makes sense, right? Please, if you walk away with nothing else tonight, remember all behavior has a function. All behavior is communication. That negative behavior that you might experience at home or your child is experiencing at school, that's communication. There's a reason. I don't necessarily know what that reason is, nor do you, but we can get to it, right? With some sleuthing, you can get to it. For children with anxiety, I find negative attention is often easier to get and it's easier to understand. Right? We think we know what to do about negative behavior. But if we're not recognizing that, that might, in fact, not always, but might stem from anxiety, we're probably not responding appropriately. What are some predictable anxiety triggers? I find unstructured time is a big one. Uh, transitions can be a big one for a lot of kids. Unexpected change, oh my goodness, you have a child who needs to know when the schedule is going to change. Or uh, you're throwing them off. That's a big one. Um, antecedents to negative behavior. I sometimes see unfacilitated social interaction as a time when we see negative behavior. What's unfacilitated social interaction? Sex. <laughs> the bathroom. The bathroom. The bus. Unfacilitated social interaction. <laughs> Being asked to wait. Oh my goodness. That can be a tough one for anxious kids. Being told no. Even something benign. Being told no about something small can be a real trigger. Writing. About that one, big one. Lots of, that's a big one for a lot of gifted kids. And again, transitions. So I want to give you a few tips. This is just the tip of the iceberg, truly. But maybe another way of thinking about some of the anxious or white behavior that you run into with kids. Uh, one tip: Do not ignore low-level attention-seeking with an anxious child. <coughs> Their anxiety often goes up, which seems kind of like typically if we've got some negative attention seeking we want to ignore that right with an anxious child you might say oh that's actually going to make it worse instead you're going to actively engage them at the beginning of a new situation with positive attention oh hey i cannot wait to see what you're going to think about this i'm going to check back with you in five minutes okay great and then you go do your thing and you follow through you check back in five minutes what do you think wasn't that awesome frame it for them right if they're still struggling in some way, let me give you something in 10 minutes, right? But anticipate this. Give them some positive attention at the beginning of a new situation. I often do this too about um, maybe a birthday party, which can be a positive thing, but maybe a little bit anxious about going into that new situation. Tell them what to expect. Tell them how it's going to be. Give them an idea of what they can do that's positive. Give them <coughs> an actual action. Right? Rather than just kind of ignoring how they're feeling and expecting them to move through that. <coughs> um, another counterintuitive tip for anxious children, don't publicly praise their positive behavior <coughs> because their anxiety will go up. Instead, nonverbal, powerful, right? A wink, a nod, a thumbs up. I see you. <coughs> I know what you did there. That's all powerful versus calling them out and praising them in front of even a, a family member. But just that powerful nonverbal communication really can set their mind at ease. Don't use a countdown. <coughs> if you've got an anxious one, countdown often does not work well. <laughs> you've got some experiences with that. 
Instead, we're going to walk over to them. Say, hey, we got we got to pack up. It's time to go. Let's find a good stopping point. Right? Not the five minutes, three minutes, two minutes. I got I'm almost. Uh, right? That's that ramps up anxiety for a lot of kids. Some that works beautifully for us. If it's working beautifully. Don't change it. <laughs> but for some, we might need to go and join with them to find a good stopping point. Giving them an in-between step with transition also works beautifully. Now this is one that um, I use in the classroom setting, but you can find a, an alternative for a transition at home as well. So if you have a child who struggles coming in from recess, to go directly to seat work, for example, um, you might find an in-between step. Here they, you know, the, the example is coloring or, or a, a quick video or a quick discussion on a, a topic related to what we're transitioning into, and then we jump into the seat work or the quiz, for example. Right? So think of some situations in your own life, your own experience with your, your kids, that you might apply that same tool. <coughs> Help the child rehearse replies to confrontation. Again, this is an example on the playground. If you've got a kid who's always butting heads about the rules of Foursquare, yeah. that's a fraught topic. <laughs> Help them rehearse a statement. Help them rehearse an action, what they can do when that situation happens. One that I like that puts a little power and control in their hands is, I don't have time for this. I'm going to walk away. Right? Um, if they're a kid who wants to throw something, again, we're going to give them something else, like a piece of paper, which is a lot harder to throw. Something that kind of helps them manage this. And we're going to rehearse it. I get so goofy with kids in my office. We're going to role play. We're going to, we're going to talk through this. <coughs> Just be silly and have some fun with it. It doesn't have to always be serious. But having the fun with this gives them the tools. And actually <coughs> practicing it, not just talking about it, makes it more likely that they're going to be able to use it in the, the real situation they might encounter. This is a helpful one. Boy, when I learned this, I used it all the time. Teach them not to ask yes or no questions. And try not to use yes or no questions with them. So you might have the child who says, can I, can I work with so-and-so? Can I work with so-and-so? How about now? Can I work with so-and-so? And often you're wanting to just say a yes or a no. And if it's a no, can I work with so-and-so? How about now? Can I work with them now? Reframe it. Oh, you want to know when you can work with so-and-so? OK, you can ask, when can I work with so-and-so? That puts the power and control back with you. You set the time frame. They have that answer. But it's not a yes or, a, or rather a no that then leads to a blow up. Right? It's subtle. It's subtle, folks. But it, it works. Right? How many of you have teens? A few of you. Yeah. So I want to make sure that I, I spend a little bit of time. A lot of this content is targeted to kids in the elementary ages. But I want to make a point, and I think these same kind of rules apply. When you're talking to kids about anxiety, and especially teens, just start by being curious. Not judging, just asking how they're doing and being genuinely interested in their response. Right? You might start with, oh, yeah, hey, I've noticed lately that this is what's going on. No judgment. Even better if you're doing something together and you're not eye to eye, right? You probably all know that tip. But the sit down, talk, eye to eye, often it's a recipe for getting your child to shut down. If you're in the car together, you're walking together, you're washing the dishes together, something likely to get them flowing, right? Show trust. They want to be taken seriously. Show them that you take them seriously and that you trust them. Don't be a dictator. <coughs> you can offer ideas, but you can't solve it all. You're there to collaborate with them. You're not there to tell them what to do. Even though you know what to do, right? You've had the experience. You've lived it. They've got to make their own mistakes. they got to learn their own way. So you're there to facilitate and collaborate, not dictate. Make sure you praise them. I think we do this less and less with our teens as they get older. It just becomes a 
expected of their behaviors, but they need that self-esteem boost too. Make sure that you genuinely say, hey, I notice and I appreciate and I'm proud of. Control your own emotions. This is a big one for all of us. These are less able to think physically when they're emotional. If you can stay calm, they're more likely to follow your lead. Easier said than done. So, as another reminder, well-being is a skill that can be learned, right? It can be learned and practiced. One of the things that I talked to the kids about today is that what you practice grows stronger. Think about your own child. I'm going to give you a minute just to think of, about a day in the life of your child. Start with when they wake up in the morning. Try to walk yourself through their day. What's it like in the morning before they go to school? What's their first hour of the day like? Their morning. What's recess like for them? Or lunchtime? Their afternoon? What happens for them after school? Where are they? Who are they with? What are they doing? <clears throat> what are their evenings like? When you walk a mile in their shoes, whew, it really gives you perspective. It really helps you recognize some areas that maybe we can adapt and adjust. Maybe some areas where we can connect better or we can anticipate better what we need to do, right? So as you're driving home tonight, I hope you'll think a little bit about that, about a day in the life of your child and, and what insights that gives you. Anytime I see a child, these are some of the key domains that I like to look at. I really believe in practicing integrative medicine, and by which I mean we really look at all facets of the child not just the thing that's not going right, but all things that might be going well also. Um, sleep is huge, right? We know that, that sleep is huge for kids with anxiety, kids who are struggling, huge for their well-being and our nutrition. What are they putting in their bodies? And when are they putting it in? Are they staying hydrated? Are they getting the right amount of protein? Are they limiting processed foods? All of those kinds of things. Um, their movement and activity levels, what can we do there? The mind-body connection, that was another area we talked about quite a bit uh, today in, in other situations when I've talked with kids in classrooms, mind-body. And I have to say it's so cool to see so many of your kids recognizing there is a mind-body connection, right? How we feel affects how we think, how we think affects how we feel. I love that I've seen so many kids using healthy techniques. Deep breathing. Um, deep breathing. Yoga. Meditation. And all their sweet, simple little things like, I just talk to someone. I tell someone how I'm feeling. I cuddle my dog or my cat. Or I go shoot hoops. Or I, I don't know. Silly, simple little things, but they could, every single one of them recognize those strategies that they use. I hope that you'll go home and ask your kids, what do you do when you worry too much? And I hope they have a genuinely good answer for you. If they don't, there's your homework, <laughs> right? There's your homework. Help them remember some strategies. Teach them some new strategies. What are your techniques? What do you do for yourself when you worry too much? We got to model that too. And that leads me to this. Look at your role in things as a parent. Children take their cues from us about how to interpret and how to respond to situations. Make sure that you're modeling healthy self-care, that you're modeling healthy ways to respond to difficult situations, that you're modeling how to take another perspective on a situation, Kindness, empathy, model that. 
if in your interactions with your child or others, your, your response has been, shall we say, less than ideal, <laughs> recognize that you can't get bogged down in that. It happens. We're human, right? Absolutely, we're human. And don't get bogged down in guilt. Instead, learn some new techniques. Practice these new techniques for stress tolerance for yourself. When it's appropriate, explain yourself to your child. Make amends. I often say kids might see parents um, arguing or having some kind of conflict. They rarely see when you make up. They rarely see the discussion that comes after where you solve it, right? I think we need to be more intentional about making sure that kids recognize conflict is normal. Conflict happens, and there's healthy and productive conflict, and there's some that's not so healthy. And so we need to make amends when it's not so healthy, and we need to model how to solve things in a more productive manner, right? Make a plan, know when you need to disengage, know when you need to find a support system as well. It's huge for your kids. We, you probably, <coughs> all of you, learned or, or heard about self-regulation, right? We want our kids to learn these skills of self-regulation. We want them to learn to focus, we want them to learn self-control. We want them to learn empathy and perspective taking. We rarely think about the fact that we, in fact, co-regulate with one another. <coughs> we co-regulate. That's from a field called interpersonal neurobiology. Um, fascinating area of study. But it really tells us a lot about how we interact with one another and how we impact one another. Okay? So keep that in mind as well. Be purposeful in building those skills. As we close tonight, I want to leave you with one of my favorite techniques for just taking a pause, taking a break. It's the 478 breath. A lot of your kids know this or have learned this. Maybe they practice it at school. So if you're willing to give it a try, all you need to do is sit with your back straight. Usually both feet on the floor is good. And I'll walk you through it first. You're going to exhale just to kind of whoosh all that air out. Then you're going to close your mouth and inhale through your nose to count of four. You'll hold that breath for a count of seven. And exhale again through the mouth with that whoosh for a count of eight. We're going to try that three or four times. Ready? Let's do it. Inhale for four. Hold for seven. Exhale for eight. Inhale for four. Hold for seven. Exhale for eight. Inhale for four. Hold for seven. Exhale for eight. Inhale for four. Hold for seven. Exhale for eight. Fabulous. I've done my job because when I taught this to kids today, some of them said, make sure you teach that to the grown-ups. <laughs> <laughs> I love the four, seven, eight breath for this reason. It's simple. It takes almost no time at all. It requires no equipment. You can do it anywhere, right? You always have it with you. I could get into all the, the physiology behind it, but it truly works as a, a natural tranquilizer for the nervous system. It's subtle at first, but it gains in power with repetition. <clears throat> so I encourage all of you to practice that 478 breath for yourself, or whatever technique works for you, um, to self-regulate and to co-regulate. I wish we had time for more. I really enjoyed talking with you guys. I think we'll close the Facebook live stream now, and we'll take a little bit of time for questions. And uh, general questions are welcome. Thank you.